Don't shower every day? Uh, I don't shower every day. And a washcloth. Why would I need a washcloth? To wash yourself with. It's in the name. Washcloth. pH balance is off, and you want to know why? It's not because you're born with it. It's because y'all keep dirty ass I wash my hole. I wash my asshole. I wash my everything. Get your dirty ass oh, in that <laughs> I'm a big fan of waiting for the steak. When you're 69 your ass ain't but one inch from your loved one's nose. I wash my mother ass. Not so fresh down there? No. There must be something wrong with you. You got to wash your ass. What? Y'all take 365 <laughs> showers a year. No. Black people use washcloths? I don't know any who don't. I want you to stop fing bougie like you ate. Wash that in the sink. Because I know you have. Your dick's more like mustard. When I was in middle and high school, the one rumor a black girl could not escape was regarding her genitals. Her stinks was the insult and slander like being called a hoe that needed no verification and could spread like wildfire. One rumor or one bad day was all it took. Of course, very few people like having an odor, vaginal or otherwise, but in the black community, there's a recurring contest over hygiene habits that often comes across as performative. Think about the backlash to social media influencer B. Simone oversharing that she takes showers every two to three days, or the commotion over Summer Walker using a washing bowl. In response, some black women declared that they showered two to three times a day, sometimes more. Others encouraged the women to douche. And while two to three showers may be understandable if you live in the belly aching heat with little AC access, for those of us in mild temperatures, it's not necessary. And douches, contrary to popular belief, are never necessary. So why does the black community, especially black women, keep engaging in hygiene Olympics on social media? It's fun to discuss, to a degree, the ways in which we're different. And for people who didn't grow up learning about hygiene, the conversations can be helpful. Yes, change your toothbrushes, towels, and wash rags frequently, and don't neglect that ass crack. But where does the overcompensating, three showers a day, douching with Lysol, etc., come from? How does it fit into a broader pattern of mainly white celebrities sharing that they don't bathe? And more pressingly, how has the vulva health of black women been compromised due to the desire to escape racist stereotypes and not be compared to people who don't wash their legs. First, we'll have to talk about hygiene history. I'm washing me in my clothes, bitch. I'm washing me in my clothes. But first, can I get a round of applause for this video sponsor, Beducated? If you love my videos, you've likely heard about Beducated, which offers over 100 inclusive and accessible courses that answer your most puzzling and important questions about sex in your body. Come on now, you know we all have questions. There's sources on sex and disability, destigmatizing STDs, and even self-care journey videos about topics from endometriosis to vaginal pain. If you want to pick up some new skills for your solo repertoire, watch with a partner, or even do some sexual healing, Beducated is your source for high quality and reliable information created by certified experts. And while lessons can be explicit, it's not pornographic. The most recent video I checked out was Shibari instruction because I'm curious about being tied up. And if that doesn't tickle your pickle, I told you there's a bunch of courses to choose from. And you can try all of those courses for one day free using the link in my description box. Seriously, you won't get charged within the first 24 hours and you can cancel anytime. You can level up your love life for just $10 a month. And if you want a yearly pass for the rest of March to celebrate Beducated's five year birthday, you can get 50% off your annual subscription using my code Lexus. There's even a 14 day money back guarantee. Plus, every sign up helps my channel. Scroll down to my description box for the link and don't forget to tell Beducated Elexis sent you. Also, don't forget to check out other Beducated sponsored videos like a short history of oral sex, masturbation, and others. PDH, or public displays of hygiene culture, didn't blossom overnight. Think of all the song lyrics about smelling like water, nothing, or sweet desserts. Plus all the lyrics by artists from Rico Nasty to Cardi B to Lil Wayne mentioning stank or comparing to fish. Remember when eating pineapples for a sweet taste 
pussy was all the rage. I have family members, black southern women reared in the mid 20th century who used douche bags mixed with Lysol and who sprinkled their panties with talcum based baby powder. Searches on social media and internet forums show this practice of toxic chemical as a cleanser has never died. There's a genre of YouTube and TikTok videos of black women walking the viewers through their massive collection of hygiene products and videos rating hygiene products for quick fixes that likely do damage in the long term. When noting an uptick of black people's purchases of hygiene and personal care products in 1969, Deepart Gibson, the founder of the first black PR firm wrote, undoubtedly, much of the desire for cleanliness is to overcome the prejudicial old wives tale that all Negroes smell bad. The racist misconception that black people are inherently dirty blossomed during American slavery for a number of reasons. In Africa, cleanliness has long been a central component of various cultures. Enter the rise of the intercontinental chattel slave trade. While being kept for months in slave dungeons on the coast of West Africa, enslaved people wallowed in various body excrements, blood, urine, feces, vomit, etc., until being transported on equally unsanitary ships for months at a time. In Solomon Northrup's 12 Years a Slave, Patsy, a teenage girl being raped by the sadistic enslaver Edwin Epps, was refused soap by the man's wife both to punish and humiliate her but also to deter the enslaver from continuing to forsake his vows. Patsy sneaks off the plantation to go get some soap, and when caught, she tells Epps, Mrs. don't give me soap to wash with as she does the rest, and you know why. It's clear how important hygiene was to Patsy and other black women to risk injury or death for a bar of soap. Some enslavers withheld soap as a form of punishment, and others simply didn't provide the enslaved with soap to save money, seeing it as unnecessary because the enslaved were not actually humans with basic needs. This neglect of hygiene caused death and illness for all enslaved people. But for black women, their fragile vaginal microbiomes were no doubt impacted by the conditions. Additionally, the sexual assault of black women and consensual sex with partners with less than adequate hygiene could further complicate matters. When you mix in the long-term historical aversion and demonization of vaginas because of monthly periods, the Old Testament literally calls this period of time for women unclean and claims that it makes those who come into contact with it also unclean, the desire to be clean and project cleanliness is no big surprise. With freedom from slavery came a renewed desire for and access to cleanliness. It would be enfolded into respectability politics, being better than the stereotype given to us by racism as well as a religious tenet. Cleanliness is next to godliness. And plus, it made good sense. Even still, racist ads at the turn of the century continued linking blackness with filth, like the infamous pear soap ads that washed off black skin. Meanwhile, germ theory was making bathing with warm water and soap a regular recommendation. In fact, segregated public bathhouses would spring up in urban centers like New York, Philadelphia, and Chicago. Mind you, this is centuries after the ancient baths and habits of the Moors, India, China, Japan, etc. And prior to the 50s when public bathhouses fell out of popularity with the rise of home plumbing, black Americans would own and patron black bathhouses. Right before the dawn of the 20th century, douching became a popular option for contraception. Though douching after sex only reduces the chance of contraception by about 30%, I'm sure women of the day took what they could get. And thanks to obscenity standards from the 1873 Comstock Act, douches and vaginal syringes were billed as feminine hygiene products. Later, after the availability of condoms and diaphragms, the latter of which was the most prescribed birth control by the 1930s, douche advertising morphed. A recurring theme reflected the target audience. Otherwise perfect women who ruined their marriages because they didn't pump benzalconium chloride or other chemicals into their vaginas to control odor. That benzalconium chloride is Lysol, by the way, a brand you likely have below your sink. It advertised itself throughout the 20th century as a gentle cleanser, far more effective than vinegar douches. 
After World War II, two important things happened. The consumer economy reignited and companies slowly began seeing black people as a worthwhile consumer base. So advertisements for douching to black women became more numerous in the years to come. In the Chicago Defender, Lysol told black women that their product would leave them smelling sweet, clean, and dainty. A 1967 Ebony ad for Massengill douching products said, it's a feeling of thorough inner cleanliness that only a Massengill douche gives. Six years later, Massengill informed Ebony readers that douches clean out vaginas after intercourse and wash away normal vaginal secretions. There are a lot of ads for douches in Ebony magazine from the 60s to the 90s. And meanwhile, douching did not start to be officially discouraged by medical professionals until the 80s and it was a slow process. Plus, for girls and women with a combined lack of healthcare access, family members who use douches and no public school supplied sex education about vaginal care, the continued ads were just the cherry on top. Rather than addressing why vaginal odor occurs, wearing tight non-cotton underwear, the cheating dicks of partners or the dirty fingers or tongues of partners, inadequate diets or water intake, feminine hygiene products that destroy the body's natural pH, etc. Those feminine hygiene products become integral to a woman's routine. A 2002 study found that black women are 34% more likely to douche than white women. And though this is often to prevent or treat an odor, douches actually cause bacterial vaginosis. A 2002 review of multiple studies found a link between douching and certain cancers. And a 2015 study found that black women in the sample who douched had 48% higher levels of an endocrine system disrupting chemical that extends product fragrance shelf life. Feminine wipes and gels were linked to urinary tract infections in a 2018 survey. And douches during pregnancy increased the risk of preterm birth. Most interestingly, research has indicated a link between intimate partner violence and douching. Summed up Dr. Angela K. Guy Lee, African American women and white women that are most likely to douche have limited educational and economic resources. They are often reliant on male intimate partners for resources. Their lack of power in intimate relationships makes it more difficult for these women to refuse sex, require condom usage, and leave abusive relationships. Additionally, in IPV relationships or relationships where sexual currency is key, if a woman needs to heal from an STD, wait for her period to end or be treated for BV, the need to use a quick acting douche to keep a partner satisfied isn't shocking. It's well documented that both women and especially men lack a knowledge of female genitalia. Shit, think of the historical misconception that large clitorises or long labia lips, aka beef curtains, are signs of being overused or stretched out, or the hoteps who claim black women's periods aren't natural. So obviously when it comes to how vulvas should smell and what should be done if there's an odor, dangerous misconceptions have always abounded. I declared 3-6 Mafia's Juicy J in 1999, slob on my knob. I started to knock, then came the odor, smelled like mush, should have had a whoosh, told her to stop and take a dush. Of course, Juicy J isn't a doctor or influencer, but douching is the most popular in the black community and I couldn't resist a 3-6 Mafia reference. And while the prevalence of women in America who douche has dropped from 30% in 2000 to approximately one in five, feminine hygiene companies as a whole continue to push their products, advertised as being for the exterior vulva. In 2010, Summer's Eve ran an ad in Women's Day titled Confidence at Work, How to Ask for a Raise, and listed eight pieces of advice, the first being doing all the things you do to feel your best, including showering with Summer's Eve feminine wash and carrying around packets of Summer's Eve feminine cleansing floss. The message was, of course, that you may not be eligible for a raise if your pussy has a natural scent. The Honey Pot was founded by Beatrice Dixon in 2014 and was special because it was plant-based. In an interesting marketing twist, Dixon said the idea for the wash in the company came to her from an ancestor. And when the Honey Pot changed ingredients in 2022, there was intense backlash by a core audience of black customers due to a new ingredient that would extend shelf life, but that black chemists on Twitter rebuked. By 2032, intimate wash products are projected to be a market worth approximately 7.92 billion. Despite the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists 
gynecologist, not recommending such products for use by anyone. But even as I say that, it must be noted that black women specific studies of our vulvas and vaginas have only recently been studied at great length. A lot of vaginal health has been filtered through studies with a bias towards white women, but there are ethnic differences. A 2014 study, for instance, found that women of European ancestry are more likely to harbor a lactobacillus dominated microbiome, whereas African American women are are more likely to exhibit a diverse microbial profile. Per the study, ethnicity, pregnancy, and alcohol use correlated significantly with the relative abundance of bacterial vaginosis associated species. Trends between microbial profiles in smoking and number of sexual partners were observed. However, these associations were not statistically significant. In addition to being more likely to develop BV, black women are more likely to have recurring yeast infections. Knowing how sensitive our p***ies are, perhaps this is why so many of us tend to have the same visceral reactions of disgust when people are careless with their pH balance. And also, maybe this is why so much steadfast public displays of hygiene occur when someone black doesn't follow hygiene rules. While black social media users continually argue over hygiene practices, from how often to wash and replace rags, to whether or not B. Simone was trolling for marketing purposes, white people casually mention less than stellar hygiene practices like not washing legs and taking more shits and having more sex in a year than they do showers. No, I didn't make that up. Someone tweeted their record for 2022. They did it proudly. They put it all out on the timeline. They do not live under the shadow of the racism that deemed black people inherently dirty. The same racism that made many enslaved people live in unhygienic conditions. In an essay by a white preventative medicine and public health physician who makes no mention of bowel movements, he explains why he doesn't shower. You stop smelling bad. I mean, you don't smell like rose water or Axe body spray, but you don't smell like B.O. either. You just smell like a person. I've been at enough packed clubs, bars, and airports in my life to tell you that people stink. This guy's primary incentive for not showering was winning back the time that showers take, which seems to be a hefty price for making people smell the sweat, shit, and dirt caked on your orifices. Then there are other takes that caring about hygiene is classist and that being offended by body odor is problematic. In this view, poor people are seen as the literal great unwashed who don't care about hygiene because they're too busy trying to survive. On one hand, there are extremely impoverished people, particularly children, who lack hygiene care access, something that many school counselors note every year when having community charity drives and fundraisers. But on the other hand, considering the rich celebs who brag about skipping basic hygiene, making a conscious choice to go without washing your ass when you have the tools to do so is not noble or unslanderable. Wrote Nicole Froyo, these quirky confessions of bad personal hygiene are seldom about access or the dehumanization of being seen as dirty. They're about some kind of personal freedom rhetoric. Not washing your legs or not taking a shower every day is not class rebellion, but a display of which bodies are allowed to be unwashed without stigma attached. So I said earlier, people be stinking, especially to us lucky sons of bitches with very sensitive noses. I smell when you haven't brushed your teeth. I smell when you eat in large amounts of garlic. And I can also smell when you spritz expensive perfume over weak old sweat. You're not obligated to smell good for me, but I'm not buying that most non-sociopathic people are consciously choosing to have offensive body odor. Public schools historically have not taught full body cleanliness, nor do they teach that some foods like fish and garlic, for instance, can cause vaginal and body odors for some people. People get comfortable in their own scent and hygiene habits, and that can be hard to break by adulthood. Most people rely on parents, friends, and advertisers telling them how they smell. If they feel comfortable enough squeezing in a question at a 30-minute gynecologist appointment, maybe they will, if they can afford it, you know? But a lot of people have been on their own. And when it comes to the hygiene Olympics on social media, I'd like for us to be gentler with people who have poor hygiene habits by making hygiene info more available without being condescending. It'd also be great if we could recognize that lack of self hygiene from poor mental health, prominently depression, by people who otherwise know how to wash, 
it'd be great if we could extend them grace that life otherwise doesn't seem to be extending. If someone is depressed to the point of suicidal ideation, for example, would it be surprising if they stopped giving a fuck about hygiene? Does this mean not busting out laughing or trading jokes when someone proudly says they don't wash their butt cracks or legs out of like, LOL, a choice? No, or when someone insists that poor people don't wash, a lie, as plenty of poor people will tell you. No, run those jokes. But understanding that sometimes neglect of hygiene is a sign of mental spiraling or depression can be a step forward for destigmatizing mental health overall. I'd also like to see legislation making pads and tampons free, especially in prison and for homeless people, though for everyone would be nice. There are 16.9 million people living in poverty who have periods in the US with about two thirds having to choose between buying food or menstrual products. By the way, only four states in New York City provide free tampons and pads to inmates, and only 17 states in Washington, D.C. provide free products to school students. In jails and prisons, there are reports of soap and feminine products being withheld as punishment, which is especially pertinent to black women, because we're three times as likely to be imprisoned more than any race. Also in the future, I'd like there to be more research and solutions focused on black vulva owners because often our needs have been sacrificed on the helm of misogyny and racism. What does our more diverse vaginal microbiome mean for current and future vaginal products? Will we one day look back on some of these same contemporary products with the same disbelief as talcum baby powder by Johnson & Johnson, which has been linked to cancer? And as I film this right now, there's literally a period panty company that's being sued for alleged toxicity in its products. Will girls one day be my age and recount their female relatives using Lysol douches and baths? Or will the dutiful gynecologist dispelling vaginal myths on TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube change the next generation? Lastly, will future women desire for their pussies to smell and taste like water? Or like if you like this video, make sure you like and subscribe. I'm pretty sure YouTube has demonetized it even though I'm gonna do, you know, little censors over all of the words. I wanna do more short rant style videos like this in 2023 and beyond. Is there anything you want me to rant about? No guarantees, but drop a comment. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you like and subscribe.